grew up in the Royal Air Force. My father was there, his grandfather. And I started working on uh, vehicles at a very early age. So I think that's where I got my taste for working with tools. But eventually, I went into the Royal Air Force. And during that period, I was both engineer and pilot. Later on, I was approached after a spinal cord injury to devise a system that would allow paraplegics to fly anything from gliders, uh, fixed wing, and ultimately helicopters. Helicopters was by far the hardest challenge. Not only do we have to work with our hands, but we also have to use our feet. And in essence, we have five controls. Whatever we do to one, we compensate with the others. So we, it took a, quite a bit of engineering to work out how do we operate foot pedals without the use of legs. Helicopters are a lot different from fixed wing aircraft. We need a very gentle touch on the pedals. So the problem was, how do we simulate the action of a leg? How do we get that very gentle input on the pedals, but at the same time keep it proportional to the input? So in essence, if I am holding the stick, or if we would call it the cyclic, and I'm moving that around to control the helicopter, I also need to control the foot input as well. So we decided to use a thumb input. Now what we have to do is match thumb to leg. So whatever speed the thumb will move at, the leg would match it. And we had to do that in the form of a control. When we started this program, robotics was in its very early stage. Programmable chips were just coming into the industry. But what I'd like to do is show you the main components. So let's start at the bit that we're most interested in. This is the controller. And this would normally sit atop of the cyclic. So you're giving a left or right thumb input. So obviously, if the thumb is moving to the right, that's going to be a right turn. Conversely, left, left turn. But we now have to make sure that whatever speed the thumb moves at, the device that we're going to use will work at exactly the same time. So of course, we need different rates of speed. We need different forces. If we're flying in aircraft, it's a bit like riding a bicycle. If you think about pedaling on a flat road, it's a fairly constant pressure, but as we start to climb the hill, we now have to deal with different forces and different speeds. We're going to need more pressure on the pedal. We're going to use more energy. So this device had to be able to do the same thing. If we were to use an electric, electric actuator, we're getting a constant speed movement. It's going to be extremely robotic and very unstable in the helicopter. So after trying many different devices, we came up with what works now is a pneumatic ram. So we have one pneumatic ram, which is controlling all the knee action. Now, it's a dual system actuator, so we actually put pressure in on each side. The problems we have with the actuators is, on the extension stroke, we'll get 100% of the power, and on the retraction, we only get 70%. Same goes for the ankle. The ankle also has a ram, and they work in unison. We use two rams of unequal size, and this allows us to get a very fluid movement. It's a little bit like braking a car. When you apply the brakes, you're going to use a little bit of toe action first. If you need to brake hard, the knee will come into play. Now this leg will react in exactly the same way with a hand controller. If I need to put a fast reaction in, the knee will actually action a lot quicker than the ankle. And it's very fluid. The nice thing again, pneumatics, well, we're not dealing with the fluid. We don't have anything that's combustible. It reduces weight. But most importantly, and we didn't do this by, by design, it was purely by accident, we realized that with the pneumatic pressures kept low, it reacts very much like a human muscle. If we arm wrestle, we feel each other out. We will increase or decrease the force. The air is compressible. Therefore, as we apply the force and get to the point we want with the tail and the action we want, if we get buffeted by a side wind, it will compress it but then it will go back to where it needs to be because the air will compress, then go back to its usual position again. So we get a very, very fluid movement. This is the third part. We call this the heart. It's a very robust little unit. And, but in basically all it has inside 
is a rocking diaphragm pump. It has a proportional valve up here. The proportional valve is controlled by, by this unit here. So all we're doing is controlling the rate of flow to the two output lines that will feed the pneumatic rams. We also have a solenoid here so that we can dump the pressure. I could be flying on my own or I could be flying with a student or maybe just another pilot. And if such times I want to change control from my side of the cockpit to his, a simple flick of a switch will activate the solenoid valve and release the pressure from my system so that they can now fly the aircraft. Aircraft voltage is generally about 28 to 30 volts. We have an auxiliary battery we can use with this. Should we lose the aircraft power supply, we run off our own internal battery. And that will give us about 30 minutes of flying time. So that's one of the safety backups that we have in place. And because we're working with air, we also need some form of micronic filtration so that we can take the moisture, depending if we're flying at high altitude, low altitude, or in a very hot environment, we're going to generate water. And that's something that we don't want to get into the system. So we need to have water extraction actually in the line. Apart from the joystick control, we have three inputs, so we can change the forces that we're going to use. Should it be a light wind, we would be using black, blue to red. So that means we can adjust it depending upon weather. We also have two LEDs inside. One will tell us when the battery is running and the other tells us if we're given a left or right input. As explained earlier, we're using a proportional valve to control airflow. One of the other issues we have to contend with because we're dealing with aircraft is RF suppression. Whatever we do, whatever we use, we've got to be sure that we do not get any radio interference because that will affect the proportional valve. Generally, we get around that by screening the cable or over the top of the control circuit for the proportional valve, which has a critical voltage to open either the left or the right port, we will actually put suppression capacitors over the top of all the critical areas so we can rule out any form of RF. We only use one unit. In helicopters we have what we call a closed loop circuit. This basically means if we pull one pedal, the other pedal will travel in the opposite direction. It's a closed loop. So once you actually wear the device and it's hooked up to an air supply, by these two valves here to the two ports on the front of the unit. On the bottom, we have a quick release plate. Now the idea of this is on the pedal itself will be a small bayonet fit that this will attach to. So if we want a right input, the leg will extend. And when we do the left, the leg will retract in so pulling the pedal so we can do it all from one leg. These, your left leg just sits in a stirrup, very much a plate similar to this one. And the idea being that when we release the pressure from the system, if both feet are on the pedals, we're not going to give a false input. The project was started in 1997. Certification was eventually granted in 2001 by the FAA. This is presently the only system available for any pilot that wants to fly helicopters. Certification is a long drawn out process. Not only do we need to satisfy the medical requirements, but we have to go through all the processes for how it will affect the controls, redundancy, single point failure. All of these issues need to be addressed as with many other engineering projects that take place. We look at the quality of the components, the life of the components, how many hours can we use the device before we have to start replacing? All these are critical with aircraft. Most helicopters like this one will have a time to each component, a life. Once that's expired, it needs to be rebuilt or replaced. Then comes the training. And not every pilot is going to meet the requirements to fly after a spinal cord injury. So the training course itself takes about six weeks and they must meet exactly the same standards as able-bodied commercial pilots. There is no difference in the training, no difference in the standards. If they can complete the course, 
it will be on their medical that they're flying with a hella leg, the same as if you had to use spectacles, no different. So once that's achieved, they can work in the industry as well as anybody else.